Good morning. Good morning, everyone. This Thursday morning. Let's do psalm study. Let's do psalmody today. I'm Pastor Dan Sheets, Zion Evangelical Lutheran Church, Maywood, New Jersey. Welcome to our Facebook page. Thank you for visiting. I um, ask you to, uh, maybe you are able to stop what you're doing right now or listen along as you're driving or wherever you're at in your home as uh, bring forth God's word today from the Psalms, a uh, deep study of it, but not too hard. And uh, we look at it through the lens of singing. That's why it's called psalmody. And that is why I do it the way of chanting. But with this exegetical um, determination and an actual intricate way to have the psalm interpret itself correctly so that you don't add too much of yourself into it. Um, throughout the, the year I've done these psalm studies and the way I've been uh, teaching them is through this theological study that you can interpret the verses in the entire psalm through the half verse chant tone way that the church um, splits that up um, going each verse and then it has the uh, the tone hash marks in them that where you sing down um, if you've seen these studies before you know what I'm talking about but they're written that way we you see them in our bulletins here at church um, I encourage you to um, get your own Lutheran service book and the Psalms in there they have those vertical hash lines there to help us on our chanting points where we vary the tone coming down but the overall nutshell of it is that you can take the ending of the half verses and say well what is this verse saying and then go up and down through the verses and see how it explains itself as uh, the Psalms are meant to be sung so the Lutheran service book has that in there for you um, this is a, a good book here reading the Psalms with Luther it divides them out there like that. That's what I'm using today. And uh, also, we have our Concordia Psalters that have all the, the music and the tones recommended and prayers in here with those vertical hash marks. So you can see how the church has broken down the psalm verses and why and how we sing them the way we do. So our appointed psalm for today is um, psalm number 108 and the 108th psalm is a psalm of thanks and it has words almost like Psalm 60 in which the psalmist gives thanks for God's kingdom already in verse 1 the psalm exalts the kingdom of Christ and prays that God will establish his kingdom in all the world and accordingly bring David's kingdom to its proper final full station for David had only a slight partial peace compared to the whole world of that which was promised to come to him. As Isaiah 9, 7 also says, he will reign on the throne of David and over his kingdom. His, son of David, Christ talk all over the place. Remember, this, the Psalms are Christ's words, um, inspired by the Holy Spirit through David, but Christ says the greater David. And so we're going to go over Psalm 108 today as the method that I've told you I teach by. Starting in verse 1, Psalm 108. My heart is steadfast, O God. I will make, I will sing and make melody with all my being. So the half verse endings there is O God and being. That's where I came down. A heart is steadfast, O God, with all my being. So that's how you can divide them up there. And it's easy, like I said, with these books, they give you those points. But O oh God and being go together. Why? Because you are in Christ. You are one with God in your being. So his name and being, his being and your being are tied together. So this is kingdom talk in this psalm and this is how it comes all together. And, and that way when you have God and your being together, it's also family talk. So we move on here in verse 2. Awake, O oh harp and lyre. I will awake the dawn. Awake, O oh harp and lyre. It's the first half. I will awake the dawn. So, wake the dawn and harp and lyre. Of course, when you're going to bang on an instrument, it's going to make noise. It's going to wake up the whole house. Uh, if you play instruments in your house, uh, 
we have them in our house saxophones pianos recorders and if you're sitting in bed or watching TV or you're doing something in the one corner of the house and somebody starts playing it's gonna wake you up and then we have the dawn talk harp and lyre wake the dawn the dawn you know you're done with the night you're done with the darkness and you have the resurrection glory of waking up in the morning and with sounds with harps and lyres the common instrument of the day um, of the Old Testament church they did have instruments instruments are good to have in the church and that's what wakes you up and you can tie it into the being in God's name because you're getting woken up by God he's the one who gives you breath and life verse 3 I will give thanks to you O Lord among the peoples I will sing praises to you among the nations see how easy that one is the half first endings is peoples and nations but it's the same thing right so peoples, we are God's people. That goes back up to being an you know, O God who wakes us up. But he also is going to wake up the nations. He wakes up the nations through his holy law, through his commandments, that they would be woken up, become part of God's being and God's people. And the psalmist here is giving thanks and singing praises. So this is an upbeat psalm. It's a rising resurrection psalm we have for us today. Verse 4. For your steadfast love is great above the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the clouds. Once again, uh, similes right there in the ending half verses, heavens and to the clouds. So look up. Look up for your redemption is nigh. So we are not a down people, although we are down to earth and Christ, Christ in the flesh came down to earth. It is always about lifting up your head. And who are we going to praise? Because who's among the peoples? Who's among the nations? Whose throne is above us all? The being that we are one with, our one and only true God. And so his love is great above the heavens. You know, we, we do that all the time, little kids, and with our family relationships. These, you know, you've seen these cute little things. I love you to the moon and back, or I love you this big. You know, this is the same thing here. This is, you can go up to the highest heavens, you can't even see above it. But that is the greatness of the love and faithfulness. It says here, your faithfulness. That's not ours. It's his. So that refers to the faithfulness of the Lord. Great, great theme in our, in our confessions and our theology on the doctrine of justification. How um, the great quote that Paul is using in Romans, that the just shall live by faith from the Hebrew in uh, he, that literally translates actually is the just shall live by the Lord's faithfulness by your faithfulness so even our faith is not our faith until it's his first and he gives it to us and this is why we can be steadfast in our beings in our souls with God we can awake with the dawn and we can be his people and we can look up to the heavens verse 5 be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. So it repeats itself. It's like a refrain in music. And it had heavens and to the clouds, and now it has heavens and all the earth. So it wants to make sure that you know it's encompassing all things. So literally the, the earth and its elements, um, but also the praise of his glorious grace is above the heavens. And because it is, that it shoots out um, across the earth. And heavens there is plural. As, as well so this is not your typical what you think oh God is in heaven no the heavens means every everything you know the the Jews uh, in Hebraic culture believed and taught and it makes sense that there was three heavens um, Paul uses this phrase uh, I know a man uh, went to the third heaven so heavens in plural and most of the New Testament when it talks about the heavens it's plural is there as well because it wants us to know that um, earth where we get to walk on the ground is the first heaven and then what uh, we know as outer space you know um, where you know the stars and the sun and the moon are that level of the realms is the second heaven and then even further above that where we typically know heaven is where God is that's the third heaven so this is um, important to know that this pluralness of heavens means that all these things 
Um, all this waking up of the peoples and the nations and his steadfast love and faithfulness is ruminating, resonating, echoing, bouncing off of all the realms there are. And verse 6. Verse 6 is going to tell us uh, why he's asking for all these petitions. Why is he able to make melody? And it is because that your beloved ones may be delivered. Give salvation by your right hand and answer me. So the endings there are delivered and answered me. Well, that is an active um, verb there. That's um, Well, it says may be delivered, so it's a petition. But be delivered means there's an action he's calling upon God to do. And therefore, it goes with answer me. So when you make a petition unto the Lord and you ask him to answer you, he's delivering you when he does answer. And because he delivers us ultimately on the cross, he answers us on the cross. And that is how it all flows back up to the greatness, his people over the clouds. The cross reigns over all the heavens and all the realms. It is what brings them all together. And so you see how these psalms interpret themselves. Um, you know, I, I did know kind of intricate pastoral studies on this before I started streaming this at all because I want to show you that you don't need to be a doctorate theologian to get what Christ has to say to you. And uh, it's most easily found in this study of, of singing the psalms as they are meant to be sung and then they explain themselves to you. So we got 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. To, uh, there's 13 verses and 108. Seven more to go. And so let's get started on verse 7. God has promised in His holiness, With exaltation I will divide up Shechem and portion out the valley of Sukkoth. All right, what's well, there's kind of a... A deepness into this verse however um, so it's a longer one but it's split up into God is promising his holiness and then talking about these locations dividing up Shechem and portion of the valley of Succoth S-U-C-C-O-T-F in the, in the ESV um, other uh, Hebrew translations into the English you can put a K there and that word uh, holiness and Succoth uh, here go together and you say, well, that's a place, you know, what is that? What's that all about? Um, well, that's the place where Jacob uh, lived for a little bit after he was fleeing from his brother Esau and, and thought he was going to be mad at him. But then uh, they came together and, and embraced. Uh, Esau, remember, tells him, you know, come live with me. Let's be together. Uh, Jacob was like, no, you know, you know, it's okay. We're still going to be brothers and all that, but I'm going to kind of go my own way. And he goes and settles down, but not for... A permanent amount of time, just for a little bit, temporary, um, in the valley of Sukkoth. And Sukkoth is where, even to this day, we get the term um, Sukkot. And uh, that is literally the interpretation of the word tent or booth. And so there's a famous um, festival, feast day. Of Israel, even to this day, celebrated in this month of September, um, the Feast of Booths, where in Israel they actually set up little booths and little tents that they stay in for the week, for the days of, of the Feast of Booths, the Feast of, ta of Tabernacles, you heard it in, in the Old Testament. Um, all it goes back to this, this temporary dwelling. Um, God had met with Jacob, um, you know, he sets up his, his memorial, and, and then he goes over here and he has. God with him. His name is changed to Israel. It's all this presence, presence talk. And how fitting then it is, as this prophesies of Christ always does, that the one who became flesh and tabernacled among us, literally, the word John uses there, and tabernacled, he feast of booths with us. He is our feast of tabernacle. He succoths with us. Goes with this word holiness. Holiness was always a real presence theme in the Old Testament. So God has promised in His holiness. So that's presence. You're, you're in uh, the holy place. That means you're in His presence. The holy of holies is what they even called it. And then this 
tent, this temporary dwelling, um, tying us into Christ coming in the flesh and Him being here on the earth temporarily, even though He still uh, maintains his, his human body form now as He ascended into heaven. But holiness and tabernacle, holiness and tent of booze go together. So this means that God has promised in His holiness. Well, what is His holiness? That's His real presence. Ultimately, His real presence of His Son, Jesus Christ, has promised that He will, with exaltation, divide out, give out that holiness. Uh, and the portion of where He comes and tents with us. So this is a good kingdom verse. This is how the kingdom is established kingdom of God is at hand. That means Jesus is on the scene. And I move on then into verse 8. Gilead is mine, Manasseh is mine, Ephraim is my helmet, Judah my scepter. More prophetic themes there going on. Judah and scepter. Christ is from the line, the tribe of Judah, um, through David there. And uh, this is possession language now. So is mine and scepter, that's a ruling, that's the right arm of, of God. He, he is over the tribes of Israel. He is over his people. That ties all the way back up into the, among the nations and the peoples. And uh, this ruling talk now and possessive talk is mine. Uh, yeah, David's singing this, but remember these are Christ's words. So the scepter that reigns from David, and he is the son of David, the greater David, is Christ's scepter. And it goes back up with that Feast of Booths and His Holiness. And so they all tie together there, His presence. Um, we see His divinity and His reign in His presence. Verse 9, Moab is my wash basin, upon Edom I cast my shoe. Over Philistia I shout in triumph. So he remembers the days of battling the Philistines and God being present. Always this God is with you. God with Israel theme throughout the Old Testament. Um, I cast my shoe. Yeah, that, you know, that's an old uh, Middle Eastern um, you know, debacling kind of thing. Rude kind of thing. You cast a shoe at somebody. It's almost like you, you let them be cursed. You know, And that goes back up to the is mine and the scepter language. Isn't that... The one who rules is like, yeah, you know, whatever. Um, you think you can walk all over me. Well, here. You can't because even my little one shoe with my little one toe <laughs> is the scepter of all scepters and the triumph of all triumph. And David remembers as we remember, as we do this in remembrance of him and his real presence, that we have that triumph and we are just as fortified and washed there's wash basin language used in there. Tying all the kingdom language together. How you're made a people in the kingdom. How you're delivered. How you're given holiness. So moving on, verse 10. Who will bring me to the fortified city? Who will lead me to Edom? So city, locations, right? Location, location, location. And it just is going back to where God has promised to be with His people, um, the remembrance of where He was, where He dwelt, where He came down, where they set up these memorials and altars. Um, it was all about, you know, being with the Lord. And so, as we began with, "My heart is steadfast," and "O oh God," and all my being, this is saying, "Well, I want to be with you, and I acknowledge that you are here." Putting the Triune God. His name with us. And then, more remembrance kind of themes here as through the history of Israel in verse 11. Have you not rejected us, O God? You do not go out, O God, with our armies. So you know the ups and down times of Israel there and captivities and not following the commandments of the Lord and the consequences of all that. Um, but then God always raises up and keeps a remnant. Um, but here in these half verses here, we have the name of God once again, but it is related to um, the ending of the half verse there for 11 is armies. Oh, God and armies. So his name uh, goes with armies, and literally we sing about that in the divine service, Lord God of Sabaoth, 
um, which literally means God of angel armies. And Christ is the ultimate commander. So, this question, have you not rejected us, O God? You can say, O God of uh, angel armies, what's, uh, what's up with that? Um, there was times where he didn't go out with them when they were not wanting to be his people, when they were not looking up to the clouds and not realizing that they were being delivered and because of his presence. So there was times where he withheld his commander and chief Christ. But at the right time, he sent him to bind up all the armies, all the spiritual and physical armies of the earth and take control of them because everything is his and he is the one who cast a shoe and he is the one who holds a scepter. So you see how you go up and down these verses in the Psalms like this and uh, resonate this deep deepness of them as we close in the next two verses here. O oh, grant us help against the foe, for vain is the salvation of man. So foe um, and against the salvation of man um, is just saying lead us to, to the truth, not to the untruth. Uh, grant us your God of angel armies. Grant us that Christ is against the foe for us. And he gives us our salvation, not man. Not the, all the rulers and, and princes and peoples of this earth that think they can save you. Um, but we need help from them. And this is in the Psalms. And lastly, with God we shall do valiantly. It is he who will tread down our foes. So just a amplification of that. Um, uh, definitely against the foe. Um, vain is the salvation of man. But with God we do valiantly and then down our foes. So there's the opposite of above in the heavens and the clouds. Um, but then when you go to man and to the nations who are against Christ that they are down we don't want to be down we don't want to be even considered the foes but we shall do valiantly um, because of God and being and the sound of waking up in the dawn and because being his peoples and him over the nations um, repeatedly heavens and all the earth all, not just in one place but in all places that we may be delivered as he answers us. His holiness is his presence of his flesh. And because everything is his and he reigns, he is the one who triumphs. And he brings us to the place of his presence in the cities. He is captain of the armies and he tramples down our foes. And we constantly have to ask for that. We pray for our enemy, uh, even uh, so-called leaders over us. Um, if they are against God, they are our enemies. So we still pray for them um, because we want them to repent and God to be merciful to them when they do repent. But nonetheless, he is against our foe and they are not where we get our salvation from. So then we have a closing prayer here for the day over Psalm 108. And then I'm going to make this live stream a little bit more further because today... Um, and our church calendar happens to be a commemoration of a, of a, a great uh, pastor in the faith and the, in the history of our traditions. Our brother in Christ, Cyprian of Carthage, pastor and martyr. We remember the saints who have gone before us. So I want to talk about that. Um, that's a commemoration of Cyprian here today. It's, uh, it's always September 16th. But before that, let us pray. You, Lord Jesus, we worship as our King. To you we have vowed allegiance, and under you do we desire to live. So govern us by your Spirit, that we always remain citizens in your kingdom of grace. And when our earthly pilgrimage is ended, receive us into your kingdom of glory, that with all the hosts of heaven we may forever magnify your holy name. Amen. So to September 16th is commemoration of Cyprian of Carthage, pastor and martyr. He... Uh, lived around uh, AD 200 to 258. Uh, during that time, he was acclaimed Bishop of North Africa, city of Carthage. And um, he was Bishop in around 248 AD that year. And during the persecution of Roman Emperor Decius, Cyprian fled Carthage, but returned two years later. He was then forced to deal with the problem of Christians who had lapsed from their faith and their persecution, and now wanted to return to the church. 
It was decided that these lapsed Christians could be restored, but that their restoration could take place only after a period of penance that demonstrated their faithfulness. During the persecution under Emperor Valerian, Cyprian at first went into hiding, but later gave himself up to the authorities, and then he was beheaded for the faith in Carthage in AD 258. So, people then, you know, that's just like our Psalm 108. You know, when you, when you trust in the salvation of man and the princes and rulers of the world and get scared and, um, you know, get brainwashed into, into fear and, and suffering rather than, than glory and glory of the cross, that Christ is over everything with his scepter. And then they realize that, oh no, you know, that's not what Psalm 08 is one about, so we want to turn. And as a good pastor, Cyprian says, well, they're going to be training and instruction, just not, oh, yeah, okay, great. Um, ominous dominus. No, there's absolution involved, most certainly, but he wanted to keep them on the path of repentance, what the word penance means, and keep them in the faith, keep them hearing the word of God, keep them singing the Psalms and hearing the words of Christ so that they do not turn to the salvation of man once again. And he was martyred for his faith, martyred for doing that, as many, many others uh, were and, and are. Um, even today, uh, many pastors are persecuted, uh, especially in these, these years of this calamity. Um, hear, hear a lot about um, views and opinions, uh, what's going on in the world today. Um, but same thing as there. They had views and opinions, and even the Christians uh, went against them. Um, instead of understanding and recognizing that God's ways are not our ways, and so they're not going to sound like the ways of men. And also that pastors are the mouthpieces of Christ, and so their instruction is for trusting in the valiant one and not relying on whatever man tells you, especially concerning the body and the soul. So it's a good day in the Lord, and you be blessed in this meditation. Um, it's recorded if you didn't catch it live it's going to be there it's going to be kept and it'll be on our youtube page here shortly as well and um so i hope you're blessed by this man uh, gives you further insight on how you can study the psalms at home as well be ye blessed in the lord always in the name of the father and the son and the holy spirit amen